Hi, this is Ken McCarthy, Jazz in the Tube, and we've got an exciting show today. Uh, I'm going to show you the book right now, Saxophone Colossus. The author is Aidan Levy, and we are so lucky to have him on this call. We're going to pick his brain because this is an amazing book. So when I'm reading, I'm reading this book, right? And and I'm thinking, this is the best jazz biography I've ever read, you know? And then I thought, well, that's kind of, you know, that that's a subjective thing and maybe I'm off, maybe I'm wrong here. And then I saw an interview that, that Aiden did with Gary Giddens and Gary Giddens kind of said the same thing in the interview. And I'm going to take it a little further. I'm going to say this is one of the best uh, autobiographies or excuse me, best biographies of an artist in any genre for any time. I mean, this is a, you really, uh, Aiden, welcome. Of course you, you, I got to tell you, you really did Sonny Rollins justice with this book. Um, and, and it's tough to call a book it's Colossus, you know, saxophone Colossus. Uh, but this book merits the, the, the title. And I want pe people to see this is a Colossus. And, but it's, it's easy reading. And I always say the best reading should be like a glass on a store window. You don't see the glass. You just see all the good stuff in the store window. And that's how this book reads. You, you never get caught up in how it's written or the, you know, you just, you're just into the story. So, um, Aiden, I want to tell you about my my um, my bias, right? Um, I love the stories of musicians, and of course, I'm very interested in in their their master works and and all the details of what they do in, in over the course of their career. And of course, you cover that uh, masterfully in this book. But to me, I'm most passionate about that period of time from when a child first thinks I want to be a musician, and to the time they're a working musician. To me, that's the real heroic journey. That's the, that personally for me, that's what I'm most interested in. And you covered this so beautifully in, in your book. And, and I, I want to talk a little bit further about something. Um, Sonny was born in 1930. And that is a very interesting year. Uh, first, I want to read a list of other musicians born that year, with, 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 if you don't mind. So Ornette Coleman, uh, Blue Mitchell, Tommy Flanagan, Paul Horn, Richard Davis, Herbie Mann, Ahmed Jamal, Hank Mobley, uh, my buddies from New Orleans, uh, Eddie Bow and, and Peter Fountain, uh, uh, Muha Richard Abrams, Ray Charles, Pepper Adams, Clifford Brown, Booker Irvin, Jim Hall, uh, my good friend Dave Amram, and of course, Sonny Rollins. And, and when I talk with David, I always talk about these guys and him as the class of 1930. Um, these, 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 they're all, they're all men. So we can, we can say, uh, they were boys when they were born, obviously. Um, these boys were born in this incredible golden time of music that we'll never see again. Uh, they were turning 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, just as this bebop revolution was catching fire. And of course, young people, you know, when you're young, you've, you're full of vigor and 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 sap and, and and just energy and enthusiasm and inspiration. So as they were reaching those very golden years, they were also experiencing bebop as it was being born. Uh, this will never, obviously, never happen again. We all see bebop in the in the rearview mirror, and I've been hoping, praying that somebody would do a good job of capturing what it was like to be a boy born in 1930 in love with music and experience that incredible explosion of creativity that took place. And, and so you did it. So thanks for indulging me in my long introduction, um, Aiden. Um, you're a musician. That's yes. right. Yeah, and I'd like to talk a little bit about that because I think only a musician could have written this book. Somebody who went through that heroic journey of one day you saw a saxophone and thought, oh, I want to play that. And then went through all the things to get to the point where you're a working musician. So before we get into the book, if you don't mind, can you tell people a little bit about your your musical career, things that you've done, your you know, experiences, training, that kind of stuff? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thanks so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. And I am kind of overwhelmed by the uh, praise you're showering on this book, because really, I, I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants with this one. Um, so there is so many books that have inspired me, and maybe we can get into that later. Uh, Let's do that. Let's make sure we do that. please. Uh, yeah, um, just just so many people who kind of helped shape this book, 
and who inspired me to work on this. But my own journey as a musician, uh, well, let's see, it started when I was, I don't know, about seven or eight years old, and I begged my parents to get me a saxophone. I had, um, you know, always gravitated towards the instrument when I saw it. Um, you know, we go to a restaurant or something, and there would be a saxophonist in the band sometimes, and I said, that that's what I want to play. Um, and when I was nine, I got my first saxophone, started out in alto, and I grew up in a town called West Hartford, Connecticut, okay. uh, just uh, two or three minutes from the Hartford line. And Hartford is where Jackie McLean settled and right. the Hart School of Music. So I started taking saxophone lessons at the community, through the community program, kind of the extension program at the Hart School. Uh, and in my town, uh, West Hartford, uh, they had this storied jazz program uh, at a, a high school in the town called Hall High School. And the program's still going. It was started in the 1950s by a jazz educator named Bill Stanley. And uh, I just had this dream starting when I was about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 years old to play in the jazz band at the school. And so many people came through that program, and I can just name a couple, Brad Meldow, uh, Erica Von Kleist, uh, Drew Sayers, who was an early teacher of mine, um, and just many, many others. Noah Preminger uh, is a saxophonist who was in my year at the school. Um, so just some fantastic musicians have come out of that program. Uh, I had a, uh, a, a wonderful saxophone teacher by the name of Larry DeVorn, who taught many people in in connecticut uh noah preminger included and he kind of worked through many of the fundamentals of jazz theory with me um but there were um there were many others uh jen allen's a great great pianist who's still in the area and making fantastic music uh chris allen um saxophonist who came out of out of that same program uh and then there were other mentors that I had along the way. Um, J-Mo Johnson, the drummer J-Mo Johnson from the Allman Brothers Band, um, lives in a neighbor neighboring town. Mm -hmm. So I got to sit in with him a little bit. And he idolized Max Roach and kind mm -hmm. of gave me a, a different kind of education in, um, in the music. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I kind of came up that way. Um, but I also always had a passion for writing and literature. Uh, so at some point it occurred to me that maybe I could put all these things together. Uh, when I moved to New York City after I graduated from college, I started uh, freelance writing uh, about music. And I, I was writing for The Village Voice, Jazz Times, occasionally The New York Times, and some other places. And also I played in a few bands. Um, I played in, in a rock band, um, and but the main gig I had was with a big band called the Stan Rubin Orchestra, mm. and I had the baritone saxophone chair for 10 years, from about 2008 to 2018. And the band started in the 1950s. Uh, its claim to fame is that they uh, played at Grace Kelly's wedding in Monaco. Uh, so I got to learn from the musicians in that group. Mm. Uh, who uh, really uh, gave me an, another kind of education in uh, ensemble playing, how to improvise, how to be succinct when you're playing a solo. Mm. Uh, so when I listen to Sonny Rollins, I think it gives me uh, a good insight into just how brilliant he is as a musician. Uh, you know, I can see just how uh, short I'm falling compared to that standard. And that that's a good thing, ultimately, because mm -hmm. it, gives, sure. you know, it gives everybody something to strive for. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's a little bit about my background as a musician. Uh, I still play uh, primarily baritone saxophone, but I, I, I play all the saxophones, clarinet as well. I have a flute sitting right here that I've been planning to learn how to play for years now and maybe this will be the year that's great 
Wow, so many points of departure there. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Sonny got his first saxophone when he was eight as well. Uh, and you have a beautiful section in the book on that. It's it. it let's see if I can find it. I I, I put a uh, a stick it there now. Oh well. He wrote he wrote some sort of a memoir. Uh, it almost sounds like a movie script where he talks about being in front of the the, the uh, store window and seeing the saxophone. And uh, you know we forget that until the twenties, I guess there was some or or uh, classical saxophone music, but until the twenties, the saxophone was kind of a joke instrument. You know, it was a, it was a novelty instrument, and it was jazz musicians who figured out, wow, we can do a lot with this thing. And so you know, Sonny again being born in nineteen thirty, he that was another wave that he was part of this this ascent of the saxophone, which started of course before he was born, but uh, was a very big deal. And he talks about how he envisioned his entire future. Uh, he wanted to you know be important. Playing the saxophone would make him important, and of course we all want to be important, especially when we're little kids. Uh, he wanted to make people happy. You know, in other words, he had this this comprehensive vision as an eight-year-old uh, of what the saxophone meant to him. Uh, and I know that interestingly, his mom raised the money to get him a saxophone, of course, and, and who else is going to do that, by the way, you know? Um, and that's how Ornette Coleman, also born the same year, got his saxophone. His, his you know, his, he, he shined shoes and gave the money to his mom. And then she put a little bit aside every week. And then one day there was a saxophone under his bed and it was, you know, the beginning of, of, uh, of, uh, of his uh, trajectory. The other thing so interesting that you're talking about is, is Hartford and West Hartford. You know, we tend to think of jazz as New York and Chicago and New Orleans, maybe, and L.A. And and unless you are in a town like Hartford, you don't realize how much talent there can be in a, quote, small city. Uh, and I'm glad you helped reveal reveal some of that. Now, of course, Sonny grew up in the Big Apple, um, which makes him a bit rare, right? I mean, a lot of musicians, I mean, there's the, the, the Powell Brothers, of course, and, and Benny Carter, uh, I think Jackie McLean's from New York City, right? And he grew up in New York City. Um, yeah. But the overwhelming number of musicians in, that we know of, the big names, they came from, you know, uh, Detroit, Pittsburgh, South Carolina, North Carolina. Uh, they came from all over the country. And so Sonny had the unique experience of living really at, 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 at Grand Central Station of of the uh, of the jazz world and he grew up in the big apple and he actually saw these guys uh his 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 heroes performing he saw them walking up and down the street uh as a kid um you know you I, and i want to take us off the track but i do want people to know you also wrote a book about lou reed that's right yeah i i did um before i did this book that came out in late 2015 yeah that's but now, I know Lou Reed and, and his wife, Lori Anderson, uh, are great big fans of Ornette Coleman. And I'm sure you, you only know an artist from his records. You don't know how sophisticated somebody is musically um, you know, beyond what appears on the vinyl, right? Uh, I do know that he spent time uh, almost in a Tin Pan Alley kind of job when he was a young man writing pop hits for a like a publisher. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that That's called the label is called Pickwick Records. And he was hired by a producer named Terry Phillips, um, whom I'm close to. And uh, Terry uh, is a jazz fanatic. And he went on to um, do Perception Records, which is a great label that um, I think their biggest hit was Dancing in the Moonlight by King Harvest, but he also produced Larry Young, um, Dizzy Gillespie, oh, really? and a lot of other folks. So, yeah, t uh, Terry and Lou Reed, Terry Phillips and Lou Reed shared this love of jazz, and Lou Reed actually had a jazz radio show when he was in college at Syracuse uh, called Excursions on a Wobbly Rail, named for the Cecil Taylor composition. So... Uh, the Lou Reed connection to this book, I would say, is somewhat uh, oblique. But firstly, yeah, he, he was a serious fan of Ornette Coleman. 
Uh, he started, he co-founded a literary magazine when he was at Syracuse called the Lonely Women Quarterly that was named after Coleman's Lonely Woman. Oh, wow. And, uh, he collaborated with Coleman at one point. But the major overlap between uh, the careers of Lou Reed and, and Sonny Rollins would be in, in Don Cherry, who's such a versatile artist. He worked with so many people across genre. He really was what Duke Ellington referred to as beyond category. So yeah, Sonny Rollins and Lou Reed both collaborated with Don Cherry extensively. Uh, if you listen to Lou Reed's The Bells, you'll hear Don Cherry on there. And if you listen to Our Man in Jazz from Sonny Rollins, you'll hear Don Cherry. Um, when the Velvet Underground reunited in the early 90s, they released an album uh, that came out in 1993. And uh, Lou Reed actually skipped uh, part or all of the release show so that he could go and see Sonny perform at Carnegie Hall. All right, so the, there there is a connection, and 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 this this reveals something that a lot of people are aware of, but a lot of people are not. Again, you, you see somebody, uh, you see their hits, and you see what they put on vinyl and what they're known for, and you don't know the depth. It's like an iceberg, you know. You see, you see the tip of the iceberg, and underneath that, I mean, you just told me half a dozen things I didn't know about Lou Reed, uh, and there's probably a whole lot more. And when it comes to American music, so many of our pop musicians are serious jazz fans. I mean, they really, they may not be playing a lot of jazz, but they know the music, they respect the music. Uh, and, and and so jazz is this, you know, we always, you know, they, well, you know, only 1% of the music buying public buys jazz or whatever it is. But you have to, you have to include the fact that, you know, a good percentage of our, of our best selling popular musicians, they all knew jazz. They know, knew were big fans, were intimate with it. Now you had access to some really unique uh, resources in in putting this book together, and 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 again, I, I don't want people to be daunted by the size. It's a big book, you know. Whoop, there we go. Um, but it's smooth. It just it's like a I, I kind of liken it to a bag of potato chips. You know, you eat, you read a few pages, and it's like I'm going to read a few more, and then I'm going to read a few more, and next thing you know, you're reading a, a bigger book than you've maybe read in a long time. Uh, now, okay. You don't have any sh uh, shrinkflation in this book, though, really. Right, that's right. right. It's it, it's an old it's an old school bag of potato chips with all yeah, with a lot of potato chips really in the bag, um, <laughs> and you are drawing clearly on a ton of material and and, and some really material that the rest of us probably are not going to have easy access to. So, can you talk about some of the the gems uh, that you were able to uh, dive into in in putting this narrative together? Sure. So. I would say there are three major sources, um, kinds of sources for the material in this book. Uh, first and foremost, interviews, oral history. Um, that oral history is crucial to jazz history. Um, getting the stories from the musicians in their own words. And that was something that I was committed to from the beginning with this project. Um, and I'll tell you in a, a couple minutes about some of the people I had the privilege of speaking with. May, may I ask you, I'm sorry to interrupt, how many roughly do you think you did for this? I would say more than 200 interviews. Wow. And I'm sure they were like extended interviews. It wasn't like five minutes. Uh, it could be different periods of time. Some might be relatively short. Some might be hours long. Some people I talked to for many, many hours on many occasions. Gotcha. Uh, so it's very um okay, i just i just want to raise one. it's hard to track people down and coordinate with them to find the time so it's not only the time you put into preparing for the interview doing the interview but reaching out contacting finding the guys finding the right time uh keeping all that material that you gathered straight it's just it's just to me it's it's an epic thing but anyway so so interviews was a key part of this book yeah it, it was a major organizational effort um, and I didn't have any research assistants or assistants in general for the book, uh, although I, I had help and you know guidance along the way. Um, I, I did all the planning for the interviews, contacted everybody, all of that. Uh, I think that people agreed to do the interview um, sometimes because they knew me, but but mostly just for the love of Sonny mm -hmm. and um, because he's such a um, 
an, uh, such a towering figure in the music. Uh, so yeah, I think people uh, wanted to be able to contribute to this and kind of share their stories and their appreciation um, of the master. So yeah, interviews are one part of the research went into this book. Uh, then um, periodicals. So looking at the history of jazz and print um, mm -hmm. across hundreds of publications, uh, not just the jazz press, also the mainstream press. And there are various research databases that I used. Um, and that was a complicated process to make sure that I could read as many of the articles that included Sonny as possible. Um, I can't say that I read all of them because there's, uh, you know, tens of thousands. I mean, maybe I did read, I don't know, look at 10,000 articles or more, something like that. Who knows over the seven years I worked on this book, but I mean, you know, just to track, to have a kind of comprehensive database of, um, sunny in print. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was that aspect of it, the downbeat. Um, I spent about three or four months in, going through the microfilm of the downbeat archives. Wow. Um, going back to 1934. And I, uh, so I, I read, uh, you know, years and years downbeat magazines, just combing it for any mentions of sunny and, other contextual uh, mm -hmm. reference points for the book. Uh, at some point, I devised a method to digitize the microfilm. So I was able to do that, which streamlined the process a little bit, but that still ended up taking three or four months uh, just working with that microfilm every day. And that's just downbeat alone. That's just downbeat. Wow. Um, that was the only publication where I, I would say I put in three or four months going through that publication alone on a near daily basis. But, um, you know, it's, it was years that I was researching um, different periodicals. And, oh, sure. Uh, but uh, that was the one, it sounds like of all the periodicals, that was the one that you found to be the richest vein uh, of, of, or not, well, there was other, uh, one, there other historic, ones. Historically, but, you know, then you, you had Metronome, uh, the Jazz mm -hmm. Review. Um, I mean, then just like I said, the mainstream press. So, if you uh, look at the notes section for this book, which which is only online, uh, but it's anybody can access it, you can see some of the periodicals that are referenced in the book. Um, it's not just the New York Times; it's newspapers and magazines uh, from across the country and across the world as well. So I also spent a lot of time going through the microfilm for uh, French publications like Jazz Hot, Jazz Magazine. Um, where because Sonny is a global artist, so yeah. you know, featured in uh, jazz periodicals across the world. Um, I did a lot of that at Columbia University, where I've been based for the past ten years. Oh. Uh, but a major uh, resource for jazz uh, research is the Jazz Institute Darmstadt. So I got to spend time there doing research, and they have one of the most extensive collections of jazz periodicals anywhere in the world. Um, Institute of Jazz Studies um, at, at Rutgers is another uh, major institution. And, and sorry to interrupt, but Darmstadt, that's Germany? Yeah, yeah, in, in Germany. Um, wow. who, who knew? I, this is news to me. This, so, so that is the one of the ultimate repositories of, of, of jazz uh, periodical yeah, information. Major, major repository and <laughs> the founder of jazz institute darmstadt wolfram knauer who retired recently uh, began compiling uh, what uh, the, what he calls the jazz index or mm -hmm. these jazz indices and um he did it mostly himself i think if not almost, i think he single-handedly did this I think that someone else has maybe taken up the mantle at this point. Um, but what he did is if you ask for the jazz index on uh, Sonny Rollins or Ornette Coleman, uh, if you want jazz index on Ella Fitzgerald, you can just email Jazz Institute Darmstadt and they'll reply with the index and it will give you a comprehensive listing 
comprehensive bibliography of almost every mention of these artists going way back. And those mention those uh, articles and reviews and features come from periodicals across the world. So you'll have Jazz Podium in there. Um, you'll have uh, German publications uh, in there. You'll have American publications, British. They have an extensive archive of Melody Maker. It's very hard to find that. So that's another resource I used. Um, and it's just amazing the work can, that they've done. Can I ask, um, you know, obviously lots of languages too, right? German, French, uh, I'm sure Italians do a lot of writing about jazz, uh, yep. Japanese. Yep. How did you handle those kinds of, uh, were you able to penetrate that stuff? Yeah, um, absolutely. Oh, really? So, yeah, so I, um, I can read French um, and Spanish, Italian a little bit, um, but I was um, kind of able to translate uh, the articles that I needed uh, for Japanese, um, Swing Journal, and uh, a couple other publications. Um, I also consulted those archives and um, was able to translate any, anything that I needed. Um, well, I, I translated more than I needed, I, I should say. Um, there, there was a translator who helped me from Japanese on one instance. That was primarily uh, with an interview um, I did with a, a, a Japanese uh, drummer named uh, Takeshi Inomata. Uh, but then the Swing Journal archives uh, were extremely important to my research because Sunny uh, was such a celebrity in Japan that there was near constant coverage of whatever mm, he was. Doing. Mm. Uh, so, um, and he was he was a a, a national celebrity in Japan. Not, uh, yeah, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, he, was, he was a national celebrity in this country too. But I, I have a feeling in Japan he might have had even more national prominence in, in the national press. I'm just guessing. Well, yeah, everybody I interviewed that went on tour in Japan with Sonny said that when they arrived in Tokyo, that it was like the Beatles had just shown up. Beautiful. Uh, there would be, um, they'd be greeted with these, um, like basically caravans um, of journalists. They'd be showered with gifts. Uh, Sony um, gave them a, a gift uh, one time every band member um it was i think a uh like a, a clock radio uh, and it said on it sony rollins um yeah uh you know he he went to japan with betty carter mm. um, that was the um first time he went over in, in 1963 and uh yeah i mean you know like i said it, it, it was like Elvis or the Beatles had shown up. Um, yeah, I wonder where we'd be. Maybe, maybe like more exciting than that for them. Yeah, yeah. I wonder where where we'd be uh, and where the music would be had it not been for Europe on the one hand and Japan on the other hand. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what a huge boost. You know, we, 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 we have a lot of jazz video uh, that we have on the site. And, you know, nine times out of ten, it's coming from France, it's coming from Italy, it's coming from um, Germany. Uh, the Netherlands, just really high quality stuff that otherwise we, you know, we wouldn't have a record of because no one really shot it or shot it well. Uh, I'm still hoping someday, this is a total sidebar, but I'm still hoping someday the Soupy Sales um, uh, Charlie Parker uh, thing shows up. I don't know if you were aware, he was on, the, when, when Soupy Sales had a local TV show, I think it was in Cleveland, um, Charlie Parker passed through town. They they did a performance on this program, um, but it's missing. But that's a, that's a whole other sidebar. So you did interviews, lots of interviews. Uh, I'm now grasping the extent of the periodical review that you did. And it all shows in the book, everybody. And let me ask you this question while I've got you on this. So we're talking about tip of the iceberg. So the book is substantial. I'm guessing it's just the tip of the iceberg. You could have maybe done an encyclopedia of uh, Sonny Rollins. Yeah, it could have been like an encyclopedia Britannica, multi-volume kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the CB Sales show, uh, we also have kind of, I think the only video footage of Clifford Brown. Right. Done. So, From Soupy Sales, uh, yeah. 
So uh, interviews. I, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the first draft of the manuscript was about twice as long as the finished book. Wow. Uh, so some of that survived in the notes section. Um, it's always painful, isn't it? I mean, it's like, what do you cut? It's like. It, it, it wasn't that painful. Oh, really? I mean, okay. I I end up writing so long usually that I've just uh, kind of inured myself to the pain of cutting out, you know, material that I wrote and maybe thought was necessary when I wrote it. But when I come back to it in revision, it's got to go, you know, kill your darlings is the idea. And, it's, uh, yeah. you know, it can be difficult sometimes, but I, I don't get that uh, sentimental about cut sections. Um, but anyway, the other major aspect of the research is uh, just archival research, going through uh, special collections um, all over the world. So first and foremost, the Sonny Rollins archive that Sonny bequeathed, uh, Sonny um, put his archive, placed his archives at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Mm. Uh, that's a branch of the New York Public Library. It's on uh, 135th Street, and it's about two blocks from where Sonny was born. Oh, wow. Uh, 137th. So it's fitting that his archives are housed there. And it's just a, a beautiful library and an extremely important institution. Um, Langston Hughes is buried there uh, underneath what they call a cosmogram. Uh, and there's this uh, amazing photo of Amiri Baraka dancing with Maya Angelou on mm. top of the cosmogram and uh, kind of a celebration of Langston Hughes' life, but also the uh, continuation of uh, Black arts and culture. Uh, so Sonny's a part of that. Uh, James Baldwin's archives are there. Oh, wow. uh, Malcolm X. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, um, so much material. Um, you know, if you're interested in Lorraine Hansberry, you can find stuff on her. I mean, just about um, any major Black artist, they'll have material there. And it comes from Arturo Schomburg's original collection um, that uh, became the foundation of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. So Sonny's archive is there, and it consists of manuscripts, so the paper part, the photographic part of the archive, uh, and then you have moving image and recorded sound. Um, and each of these collections in Sonny's archive is extensive. So the paper part of the archive uh, consists of um, hundreds of boxes, I should say more than 100 boxes of material. Uh, but each box may contain uh, you know, thousands of pages of material uh, covering correspondence, business records, uh, his mm. journals or his notebooks, um, his practice notes. Mm. And I spent months practically living at the Schomburg Center, um, just going through the entire archive. So that became really the cornerstone of this book mm. as it turned out that Sonny had saved so much material that it made it possible to uh, tell the story of his, of his life in music um, kind of on the ground as it was happening. Yeah. It really, it really, for, for people who don't haven't seen the book yet, and by the way, I recommend if you love jazz, you have to have this book. If you love Sonny Rollins, you, you absolutely have to have it. But if you mm -hmm. love jazz, if you love American music, uh, if you love the creative uh, heroic journey, this this is this is a great book. And it's yeah, the book is almost it's almost surreal, or not surreal, but supernatural. It's almost like wait a minute, how 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 could this guy know so much about the details of Sonny Rollins' life? You know, because you, you were you weren't born in 1930. You know, you you know, obviously not. You know, and yet it's when you, as you read this book, I have to tell people who who haven't read it yet, um, you're you're basically walking with Sonny Rollins from the cradle, 
you know, through his childhood, through his young adulthood, through his, you know, through the big part of his career. I mean, it's extraordinary. So now I get some insight. And you did mention it in the book that, that you had access to, to his personal archives. But just to repeat for everybody, a hundred plus boxes with some of those boxes having over a thousand pages in them. Yeah, um, and it, sh it should be noted that um, I did not have exclusive access to the archive. And that's for good reason. Um, Sonny wants that material to be available to anybody who's curious mm. about his life of music. Uh, it's there to inspire people. It's there for researchers. So all you need is a New York Public Library card and, and anybody can uh, go and do research in that collection. And uh, so that, that's got open access as long as you contact the Schomburg Center. Um, and, you know, I, I've uh, been uh, at the library looking at the archive with um, some brilliant musicians. I know that they've oh. uh, been able to kind of benefit from uh, this archive, from this repository. And the fact that Sonny documented so much of it, it's really remarkable. And I mean, it sounds like, you know, it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, it's, it's a gift that we have, it, but it's, it sounds like it makes sense. Oh yeah. Well, you know, if, if it, if it was uh, given to the center, then you'd have that material, but it's not something that we should take for granted that mm -hmm. Sonny Rollins documented his career so exhaustively. I mean, how many of us do that? How many of us actually keep a journal? Uh, how many of us are holding on to our business records, um, you know, for decades? Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, at some point, Sonny real must have realized, you know, he's he's an icon, he's a celebrity, so maybe it's important to save some of this material for posterity. But I found the journal entries and the practice notes to be staggering and astonishing. Because mm -hmm. I think it's something that I personally, I always think, oh, I should really keep a journal this year. And invariably, if I've ever tried to do it, I'll lapse out of it. So I don't have a comprehensive record of what yeah. I've been doing. And somebody like Sonny Rollins, who was a heck of a lot busier than I've ever been or ever will be, still managed to document this material. It tells you something about his character and it tells you something yeah. about his commitment to self-improvement, how introspective he was, uh, how analytical of a thinker he is. Um, so, you know, his practice notes, thousands of pages of exercises that he devised for himself in order to perfect his craft so that when he hit the stage, he could truly improvise. Right. Um, he did not get on stage and play back those exercises, which include, which, uh, consisted of interval studies, um, long tones, tonal work, uh, working on the breath, um, various patterns, uh, mastering scales. Uh, and just making sure that he always studied the fundamentals. Um, he didn't get on stage and just play that material back, far from it. But in order to be able to improvise, in order to be able to enter into a flow state on the bandstand, he needed to have this foundation. And he worked on that uh, all the way through his retirement. And that's documented in the archive. You'll see that through his practice notes going through the 2010s that he's still working on it. He's still coming back and working on the fundamentals. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, it kind of goes to show uh, if Sonny Rollins is practicing the fundamentals into his 80s, like what excuse do any of us have? Uh, you know, we don't have, we really have an excuse to not be practicing, still working it out. Um, mm. So, you know, it's it's inspiring. Um, like I said, I don't I don't think anybody can really meet the standard but i think that that's a good thing uh, ultimately uh but yeah as far as the archival research goes there were so many other archives that i consulted for this book it's not just the sunny rollins archive sure. uh, the max roach archive at the library of congress which is a major source uh for jazz historical research because max roach was another artist who documented mm. his work exhaustively uh not you know exhaustively i'm talking like it seemed like every receipt was saved wow. so when i wrote the chapter on the last days of uh clifford brown and richie powell before mm -hmm. the fatal car accident um you can see that max roach is saving the receipts 
on the days leading up to that journey for like, you know, the tolls, if they stopped and wow, new suits, uh, every hotel that they went to when they checked out of the hotel. So yeah, you were saying sometimes you read the book, you know, how could I possibly know this? And the yeah, answer right. these artists actually saved this material. Well, so, well, know, well, Max Roach <laughs> did, Max Roach did and Sonny Rollins did, but this is not typical behavior for anybody and not for right, a lot of, right. not, and not for a lot of jazz musicians. Let's face it. Well, not, not for anybody, as, as you said. So, you know, they just saw that it was important to document their careers. Well, well there's there's two beautiful things here. One, that they did it. Well, actually, there's three beautiful things. One, that they did it. What a gift to all of us. Uh, two, uh, that you found it <laughs> and, and used it. And three, that it ended up in a book that we can actually read, because most of us are not going to make it to the Library of Congress to read about the last days of, of Clifford Brown and uh, Clifford Brown and Richie Powell. That, that blew me away by that section. Just Again, that was one of these sort of supernatural things. I'm like, wait a minute. Were you in the car with these guys? It was, it, it's that vivid. Right. And like I said, you know, that just uh, the book was a debt to Max Roach for saving all this material because yeah. it's, there's nothing that I made up in the book. There's absolutely nothing that's fabricated. And the reason why it has uh, an exhaustively documented notes and references mm -hmm. section is so that anybody who doubts any piece of information, fact, or detail in this book can go and consult the notes section and say, okay, well, this is where this came from. And if you really wanted to check it, you'd, you'd find it there. You'd see. Uh, because, you know, it, it was so incredible to me that uh, many of these events were documented mm -hmm. at the granular level of detail that they were that I wanted to make sure that nobody would ever think, oh, he probably just made that one up. You know, mm -hmm. he's just, uh, because that one of the principles I committed to from the outset of this book is that I, I wouldn't, uh, there wouldn't be anything fabricated. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be any poetic license in the book. Uh, everything would have to be sourced impeccably. Gotcha. Uh, gotcha. So, yeah, like it's we're we're just all fortunate that these artists did document their wow. lives to the extent that they did while while they were living them. I mean, it's that that sounds like a tautology, but I mean, how many of us do that? As I said, you know, when you're going through uh, a uh, a rough period or an exciting period, or uh, if you're on tour or on vacation, how many of us are also saying, "Oh, I've got to file all these receipts away." At, I should really take down in a journal how I'm feeling on this day, you know, and also being in the moment at the same time. I mean, so these yeah. artists who are uh, kind of the improvisers par excellence are still also stepping back from it and documenting it at the same time. And it tells you something about how to improvise. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And any any other um, uh, musicians that did a an unbelievable job of documenting the details of their lives? We got Sonny, we got Max Roach. Those are two big ones right there. Anybody yeah. else? Yeah. So for for this uh, collection, I'll, uh, for this book, I'll mention the uh, the George Avakian collection at the New York Public Library. Um, so George Avakian, the legendary producer. Um, worked extensively with Sonny Rollins and he saved correspondence with Sonny mm. uh, going back to the early sixties. Um, so they had a close relationship and Sonny would send George these uh, extensive letters, these uh, extremely lengthy letters uh, written uh, almost like this kind of calligraphy. Um, so handwritten, uh, handwritten letters. Yeah, yeah, handwritten letters, uh, not written on a typewriter. Um, and I guess you learned how to read Sonny's handwriting. That must well, Sonny's handwriting is, is very legible. It uh, is it's distinctive. Um, yeah, and if anybody's curious, you can see his handwriting uh, because he wrote a beautiful letter to Coleman Hawkins in 1962, mm. uh, just attesting to the. Uh, importance 
of Coleman Hawkins to his career, how Hawkins is his hero and still mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. Uh, and to this day still is, uh, and hoping that he'll get to see him again soon. And if, of course, he does see him again soon and they make Sunny Me Talk. Uh, but anybody can find this letter and if you want to see Sunny's handwriting. Um, and it's it's a fairly, uh, it's a long letter. Sunny uh, turned out to be a prolific writer and, um, you know, really, uh, really a, a thoughtful writer as well. Uh, just penetrating insight. Um, so there were a lot of letters that, that he wrote. Um, I got in touch with uh, a guy in the uh, Washington DC area named Marty Burns. It turned out that uh, when Marty Burns was like a sophomore in college, he was doing a term paper and he decided just on a lark to write Sonny Rollins a letter and see what he thought about the state of jazz. And, and Sonny responded with like a six or seven page handwritten letter. And Marty saved it all these years and shared it with me. And part of that ended up in the book. Uh, but yeah, George Avakian, um, there's a jazz presenter uh, in Norway named Randi Hultin, uh, journalist and presenter. And she had a decades long um, friendship with Sonny going back to 1971, um, or around 1971. I think they met uh, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Um, but anyway, he, uh, he would, they would write these long letters back and forth to each other. And uh, I went to Oslo to do research in the Randy Holton collection. And she also uh, had photos documenting uh, her relationship with Sonny and she, uh, some film footage that she'd shot at her house where so many jazz musicians went to visit and they would always sign the guest book. Mm. Uh, everybody visit Randy Holton. And there's this one photo of Sonny um, mowing the lawn um, using a, a real mower um, which these, they still have my have, have a real mower but mowing the lawn uh, so um, yeah that that consisted of hundreds of pages of wow. letters that Sunny had written to her and she wrote hundreds of pages back and the letters from her are in the Sunny Rollins archive at the Schomburg Center uh, so yeah I mean that that's another collection that I was grateful to do research in. Um, I did that shortly before the birth of my first child. Um, my wife and I took a little trip and we went to the Netherlands and I did research there and some interviews there. And, uh, we went to Oslo and, uh, we were in Madrid and I, I ended up interviewing, uh, a former collaborator, Sonny's there. Um, I went to Heidelberg, uh, and, and well, that's when I went to Darmstadt. Uh, but anyway, Oslo was um, it was a surprise because when you do archival research, you never really know how extensive the collections might be. Yeah. So I was really blown away when I saw. I'm like, God, this is two hundreds of pages of letters from Sonny. Um, Unbelievable. You know, there's another. <laughs> So, so, so to research Sonny Rollins, you, you can literally travel the globe and find stuff almost everywhere you went. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, I, I wasn't able to travel as much as I wish I could. Um, so, yeah, like after COVID hit, I had to curtail some of that travel. But mm-hmm. fortunately, uh, I was still able to um, do research just through the Internet. Um, you know, through uh, video conferencing platforms uh, that that made some of that possible. But there's another artist named Gertrude Abercrombie, um, a surrealist artist, and Sunny was very close with her. Uh, so I consulted her archive uh, in Washington D.C. and um, at the at the Smithsonian, and it turned out that he had written. Uh, similar level of course of letters to Gertrude Abercrombie. Mm. Uh, so, you know, she has uh, one painting where there's a, a cowboy hat in it, and uh, there's a little note in, in her archive that says, um, you know, to Sonny, uh, and whose hat this really is. 
um, and you can see the photos, or you can see actually the cat. Um, so, yeah, there uh, a lot of archival stuff. But you talked about going uh, across the world. I, I really wanted to go to India because Sunny sp had spent time in an ashram in in Mumbai um, in uh, in 1968, and I ended up just researching what I could find by the ashram. And I uh, discovered that the, the Swami that Sonny had studied with uh, was still alive. And so I was able to make contact with him. Um, his name is uh, Partha Sarathi. Uh, and he was involved with Chinmaya Mission. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of guru of the, the ashram was uh, Chinmayananda. Uh, but... Uh, and and Sunny, had, I believe, had met with with Chinmay Ananda uh, while he was there. But for the most part, he was on tour, um, giving lectures and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And Sunny studied with uh, Swami uh, Partha Sarathi, mm -hmm. who's still he's in his late nineties now, Amazing. but uh, he's still giving lectures. So I got to interview uh, Partha Sarathi, and he just told an unbelievable story, which is documented in the book um yeah uh i wanted to go to japan um i couldn't do it because of covid but i was still able to interview many people in japan and as i said consult the swing journal archives um, and there's a japanese translation in the works for the book oh right great now. oh wow yeah, yeah in the wow next maybe they'll year. bring you maybe they'll bring you over yeah, maybe. I, I hope they do. Oh, oh, they should. Yeah. It's yeah. so logical. Um, now, you mentioned earlier, and I want to make sure we cover it, that you were inspired uh, mm -hmm. by a number of, of, of great uh, jazz biographies. Uh, and, and maybe you'd like to mention some of them. It, it, it's hard to name them all because there are a lot of very good jazz biographies out there, of course. Uh, what ones come to mind as being particularly inspiring to you? Uh, well... First, I'll mention Robin D.G. Kelly's biography of Thelonious Monk. Yeah. Which um, is my favorite jazz biography. Um, yeah. I would say um, there are others, you know, I, I should say favorites because um, I don't always like to, to rank these things. But right. That, yeah. It's not a matter. Of, yeah. Sure. It's not ranking, but ones, ones that particularly inspired you. And, you know, it's interesting when I'm reading your book, I was thinking of the monk book thinking, wow, yeah, this is in the same vein of that amazing monk book. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just, I'm so inspired by, by Dr. Kelly and um, you know, all, all of his work um, as a scholar uh, through his jazz scholarship um, but just as uh, I, I consider him to be kind of our eminent, uh, the eminent historian of, uh, you know, American culture, African-American culture and history um, and uh, kind of the history of um, the African diaspora as uh, it has affected U.S. history. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he, he's still just has always been and always will be a major inspiration uh, for all my work. Um, Lewis Porter um, and his work on John Coltrane and uh, Dr. Porter also uh, was a mentor throughout the process. Oh. Um, I've worked on this book. Um, Gary Giddens. Uh, when, the project um, began uh, on a, a fellowship from the Leon Levy Center for Biography. And uh, Gary Giddens was the director of the center when I began the fellowship. Oh. So, um, you know, he's a major inspiration and uh, his work on Bing Crosby, uh, on Louis Armstrong, on Charlie Parker, uh, you know, um, his book on jazz history in general. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Michelle Mercer's uh, biography of Wayne Shorter uh, is another fantastic book. Yeah. Um, Val Wilmer um, and you know her work um, just documenting the history of this music uh, being one of the, the greatest critics in the history of the music uh, I mean that I, I could kind of go on and on yeah uh, 
I, I really like his biography of, of Charlie Parker. Um, you know, I, I I found that to be a captivating book. Um, Whose book is that? I'm sorry, which one? It's Stanley Crouch. Stanley oh yeah. Parker. Uh, right. What is it? Lightning, it, lightning it, out of Kansas yeah. City. Yeah, that's another book where you you get to see all that surrounded Charlie Parker as he grew up, mm -hmm. and that's yeah, I really get a sense of the context of the atmosphere, uh, the the history that um, kind of Charlie Parker came through. Um, yeah, and then I'll I'll, I'll just say David Haydu's Lush Life the biography of Billy Strayhorn, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which uh it, it's that's just a, a, a brilliant book um i and that was supposed to be adapted for film at some point um oh wow i, I hope that, i hope that happens uh, eventually um yeah you know, so, you know as, as rich as we we feel that jazz is i think it's a thousand times richer than we know you know you, there's no end to how deep you can go into it um there's two things I'd like to talk about, um, I want to go back to the practice notes. As a musician, what was it like for you to read Sonny Rollins' practice notes? And you said there were thousands of pages. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was overwhelming uh, to see that material and to think about the monumental effort that he put into becoming Sonny Rollins. Mm -hmm. I think there has always been a uh, pernicious myth that jazz musicians, because they're working in an improvised art form, are making it up entirely as they go along and that they're not putting any effort into their craft uh, that could not be farther from the truth because they're improvising i think they have to work even harder so i think that sunny to some extent did not want to uh, discuss the uh, level of um, kind of technical work that he was doing while he was practicing when he, when he gave interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I went into the archive, I, I realized that, wow, I mean, he's, he's really, um, he's really working through jazz theory uh, for himself over over decades and decades and documenting um kind of intervallic relationships working through scales and patterns and um this is what he felt he had to do in order to master his craft this is a lot of what he did when he took his sabbatical on the williamsburg bridge mm. uh, from 1959 to 1961 he vanished from the jazz scene Nobody knew where he was. And it turns out that he felt, even though he was winning polls, mm -hmm. that he wasn't meeting his own standard. Mm -hmm. He didn't feel confident that he could create the sound that he was hearing in his head. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what he was doing on the Williamsburg Bridge was working through these patterns. It wasn't that he would just go up there and and be kind of noodling for hours. Uh, it was systematic. And another part of that sabbatical was working on his physical and, and mental health, the spiritual health. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he'd be uh, doing chin-ups and pull-ups, calisthenics, uh, yoga. Um, he got involved with the Rosicrucians. Uh, that it was all part of developing his mind. So that it could manifest in the music. But seeing those practice notes just gave the proof to the level of work that he put into it. Uh, it, it really was, just blew me away. Uh, I hope that at some point the, a method book comes out uh, based on these practice notes. Sonny 
worked on uh, this kind of book at one point. Uh, and you mentioned the in one of the opening chapters where he writes about uh, being on Music Row and seeing the saxophone for the first time. And I think that was a draft that was supposed to go into that method book. Ah. Uh, but um, it would you couldn't publish all of it because it, it would be like a like a bible of uh of, of saxophone method um but you know it, it it could make a fantastic book um it's a, like another treasury left us you know and and yeah thank thanks uh, to your book you know normally all we'd have people that saw him live you'd have the memories of that you'd have footage that exists you'd have the vinyl I always call it vinyl, even though it's streaming now. Um, that would be all that we'd know. But mm -hmm. because of what he did and because you put it in the book, now musicians know and, and fans know uh, that this was, I mean, this was a moonshot. You know, this was, you know, like a bunch of, it was one man doing it, but it was that level of intensity. You know, we got to do all this work to get that spacecraft out of the orbit and to the moon and back you know it didn't happen by itself it wasn't a lucky you know break um the last thing i'd like to talk about is is the growing up the environment that he grew up in and you mentioned that he had a band and i'm forgetting the name off the top of my head but he and a bunch of friends had a band and the fact that a lot of big name musicians that we all recognize these guys grew up together they had bands together they played together they hung out together uh again a fan might not realize that because you're seeing the the mature products that appear when they're in their 30s 40s 50s and so on and and you know you, they may you may see them on the same uh album uh, but you don't know that some of them have been hanging out since they were teenagers or younger so could you talk a little bit about those that part of it, and also the fact that he uh, was able as a young man to brush sleeves with Bud Powell, with uh, Mary Lou Williams, with Charlie Parker, with Thelonious Monk. So maybe first the the kids that he grew up with, the so-called kids. Yeah, so he had a group growing up that he called the Counts of Bop, and Sonny was the leader of the group. It had just a, a kind of who's who of jazz uh, and they all came up together as you said so jackie mclean uh you had walter bishop jr kenny drew um you know miles davis uh was somebody that sonny got to know very well when he was a teenager and um many of his peers also got to work with miles davis um he got to kind of worship at the feet of, of Bud Powell because Bud Powell would have him over to his house. They were neighbors. They were, yeah. they were practically neighbors. Uh, they lived in the same neighborhood. Um, you know, Sonny used to see his idols uh, just walking around the neighborhood. Uh, at one point he stopped and he got a headshot, um, a Coleman Hawkins headshot uh, done by the photographer James uh, Kriegsman. And he decided to wait outside Coleman Hawkins' apartment building, knowing that he'd come home at some point, and he did. So he got his autograph. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he might see Lester Young walking around the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, uh, he. So, you know, he he had this this group, and they would play these dances or what they call cocktail sips mm -hmm. in the neighborhood, uh, and that's kind of how it it all got started. Um, they were sort of like the original Sugar Hill Gang, uh -huh. um, and they, um, you know, I, I think that they, uh, as their careers developed, they weren't always in close contact, mm -hmm. but uh, they would be aware of what what they what each other was doing. And uh, in the nineties, they had they had a reunion show, uh, oh. a kind of Sugar Hill reunion show. Uh, Jackie McLean, Walter Bishop Jr., um, some other other folks in, involved. Uh, Gil Coggins is another uh, figure that um, doesn't always get his due. He's a uh, brilliant pianist, uh, and he um, gave Sonny some early guidance on uh, on jazz theory. He was a mm -hmm. little bit older, 
Um, Kenny Dorham was somebody that Sonny met early on. Um, you know, there there were just so many, there were so many uh, people coming up together in, in Sugar Hill and um, in New York City in general, because some, sometimes Sonny would go to Brooklyn uh, for a jam session and meet people, uh, you know, kind of in the outer boroughs. Um, you know, he, uh, Elmo Hope is somebody that he met relatively early on. Um, so it, it really came through the community. Mm -hmm. uh, Sonny would go to the Apollo theater as much as he could. Um, and, you know, when he discovered Charlie Parker, they would kind of chase him around town and bird really took them under, under his wing. Uh, Arthur Taylor, the drummer was, um, a very close friend of Sonny's. Um, going back to the teen years and uh, you know, he, he was in the band as well. Uh, so they had a, a rotating set of musicians that could play these gigs. And let's talk, um, let's talk, if you mind, let's talk about the gigs. So there was an audience for what they were doing, obviously uh, it was an abundant audience. It, it probably included their peers. They probably played school dances, I'm guessing. Yeah. Well, they might play, at a church, let's say. Um, so they would give, they would play these cocktail sips and like, I think it was St. Charles church um, in the neighborhood. They would play at a, a club called Bowman sometimes, and there would be social clubs that would have an event and they would book the band to mm -hmm. play uh, these shows. Um, you know, they, they weren't necessarily playing, um, you know, what you would hear at a night at the village Vanguard. Oh, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. Might, you might hear uh, flying home. Uh, you know, I, Sonny learned Illinois Jaquette solo coming up. Uh, you know, you might hear something um, more in the style of what you think of as R and B. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're these, these dances, but the thing that people don't realize also is that, um, People would dance the bebop as well. They had like a dance called the Applejack that people would do um, when they're playing bebop. Um, you know, when you see Thelonious Monk dancing, and Thelonious Monk is uh, Sonny thought of, still thinks of as, as his guru. Uh, mm -hmm. Thelonious Monk is in a way also paying homage to the fact that people could used to dance to this kind of music. Um, yeah, so. It, as I said, it really came through the community and they all supported each other. Uh, so something that I wanted to bear witness to in this book was that it, it's not just the story of one great artist. Mm -hmm. I did not mm -hmm. uh, perpetuate the great man theory mm -hmm. of history mm -hmm. and theory of mm -hmm. artistic genius in this book that it came through collaboration it came through relationships it's not just one person building it all himself it's right. that it came through interdependence and reliance on their fellow musicians and, and, com and community support and and the existence of a scene and the availability of music teachers. That's one thing you get into the book, which is his some of Sonny's early music teachers that showed him how to his way around the instrument. This is a theme that we we cover a lot in, in Jazz on the Tube. We there are great human beings and, and they are amazing, but you're right, they 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 clearly don't uh, operate in a vacuum. Uh, I always say it's going back to this tip of the iceberg thing. When you see a Sonny Rollins or a Charlie Parker or uh, you know, Duke Ellington or whatever, um, well, beneath the, the beneath the surface is this huge complex of of educators and neighborhoods and communities and and social uh, act, uh, op, uh, opportunities to perform when you're young, uh, and then all as you mentioned, all the collaboration with your fellow artists and all the producers and all the venues and all the fans that show up. It's it's this massive 
community that that gives the the and, and I will and I understand what you're saying about the great man theory the idea that 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 you know some genius just came to earth and well there's two there's two flaws with that one it, it denies the existence of the community that made his life possible uh, and two it also in a weird way denies his own genius because it's like well this guy was just born with these amazing gifts and you know he's not like the rest of us well he may not have been like the rest of us he may not be like the rest of us in in the amount of effort <laughs> that he puts out because he clearly put out more effort than the average person but he's a human being, flesh and blood. He had to go from A to Z, just like everyone else. He just so so. There are, I believe, there are great people. But your point is 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 very important for everybody to understand, especially young people. You know, uh, it, it it's not uh, magic. Um, it 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 needs to look. And this made me why 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 Sonny didn't talk a lot about the technical parts of music when when he was being interviewed. It is the job of the musician to create magic on the stage, and musicians are not supposed to show how the tricks work. <laughs> and nobody wants right. to see nobody wants to see the, music, the, the the magician practicing for twelve hours to do a two minute routine. They want to see the magic. So mm -hmm. he brought the magic, but behind that magic was a ton of intelligent, dedicated, diligent, diligent work. And and which might be a we could talk all day, and this might be a good point to remind everybody what we're talking about. We're talking about this book. And and um, Aiden is very modest about the book, really. Um, uh, you know, he, he's because he's chronicling the work of a, of of someone else in a sense, right? But the, this book itself is a great work, and uh, we need it all, right? We need it all. We we needed Sonny to do what he did. We needed the community that that made Sonny Rollins possible. We needed his diligence, and then we needed Aiden to go out and dig through all this material of which which is abundant and put it into a form that that we can uh, uh you know use it and utilize it. So uh, it's a great great collaboration of of many beautiful souls, and I hope everybody gets this book and supports it. Uh, let me know when it comes out in Japan. Yeah, I, I will. That'll be exciting. I think that's going to be a, a uh, I think that's going to be a big deal. I have a, just have an intuitive feeling about that. So we've been talking with with Aiden Levy. The book is called Saxophone Colossus. You can get it in hardcover. You can get it in softcover. Uh, has anybody tried uh, an audio version of this yet? Tried tried. Not yet. The, not yet. Not yet. Not not yet. yet. Um, uh, I hope I hope someday that becomes possible. I, I know it's 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 just another thing to do, but that would be really. I could see myself driving across country, across the country with the audio version of this book, and and listening to it a couple of times. It, it, it is that kind of book, folks. You you if you're if you're a Sonny Rollins fan, I mean this is just obvious. But if you're a jazz fan, and back to something I said very early uh, on in this, if you're interested in American culture, the beautiful aspects of American culture, uh, this book is a beautiful embodiment of it. So uh, Aiden Levy, thank you so much for writing this book and, and sharing just, this was the tip of the iceberg too, even this conversation. Uh, we, we barely scratched the surface of the surface of what's in this book. So I hope everyone goes out and gets it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks for everything that you've done for jazz.